we're going to be talking about global traffic management. Now, typically, we're talking about uh, DNS-based traffic management. Um, I'm with Bing at Microsoft. And a quick disclaimer, um, I'm not going to be representing a specific technology, more of the idea of DNS-based traf traffic routing. And it's an incredibly diverse and complex topic. Um, I'm going to gloss over a bunch of things. If you've been doing it for a long time, uh, you know, we just can't cover everything in this short 20-minute talk. Uh, right now, my role at Microsoft and Bing particularly is I'm uh, the user representative for Bing. My job is to go into meetings and, and beat the teams up over availability and uh, latency particularly. But previous to that, I spent about five years focused on global traffic routing, uh, the implementation, day-to-day -day operation of our, for Bing.com and several of our partners. Uh, during that time frame, I spent several years as incident manager, building the incident management systems for Bing and designed the incident management system we currently use. Uh, prior to that, uh, prior to Microsoft, I spent a couple years in defense contracting. And um, uh, before that, I owned a restaurant, destroyed by a hurricane. And then 12 years in the Army where I lost my hearing. So if you do ask questions later, I wear hearing aids. So please use the microphones and speak up. Um, I didn't get here alone. I'd like to make sure that, you know, that it's not just me up on that list, but this is what I'm, uh, my history. And if you need to contact me, you can get there with my Microsoft, my private email. A quick survey, anybody in the room that's been responsible for global traffic routing and willing to admit it? <laughs> All righty, thank you. <laughs> so from my point of view, you know, I did traffic routing for five years. And then I moved into kind of focusing on users, the availability and server performance world. And it kind of changed my perspective. So I think about global traffic routing in the way a lot of people do from the um, pure engineering point of view, which is typically availability and performance. But then I also think about it is what does it mean to our users and getting them the response that they expect from their services or from our services. And you have to take this into account. You know, when we sit here, and we've, a lot of these talks have been focused on the uh, internals of how we run our data centers and such like that. But at the end of the day, a lot of users' reality, their news, uh, the things that they find out about in the morning, the Panama Papers or something like that, it comes from the services that we run. You're sitting here and you're feeding people information. And if that information doesn't get to people reliably, they can have kind of a distorted view of what's going on in the world. And so I think it's important to always get back to the users um, when you're thinking about how you're running your services. And I wanted to kind of put that into context and look at one particular reality that happened in the past. I'm not going to say which event this is particularly, uh, just because I avoid the political conversation around it. But it's an, it occurred a couple of years ago, and it's still in the news today. Um, I was working at, uh, on traffic management at the time, and wanted to see how our systems responded to this event, much like the Michael Jackson event uh, that Mark talked about. And I wanted to see how our queries were distributed and things like that, and see if our traffic management was working. And so I plotted the queries uh, that were relevant to this event, and they were very common terms. And so they had background noise that would have been occurring before the event. And I plotted it before the event, through the event, and after for about a week on minute-by-minute -minute intervals. And so this is kind of what it looked like. Let's see how this goes. So what you're seeing here is the day before the event. And this is just the normal query. These are two different query terms in their normal daily rate, just kind of popping up minute over minute. And then the event occurs probably right about now. And we're going to see how quickly things change. And so that's the first day. And each time you see one of these surges that come in, it's the morning news. It's, it's the new wave of people finding out about this particular topic. And you can see the saturation we get there, basically everybody except maybe West Texas that was interested. Um, and this is an ENUS-based data set, so it, that's why it's kind of bound on the borders with some stragglers outside the, uh, outside the borders. But so this is where we landed. You can see the incredibly good coverage of users um, got this particular piece of information over this, this uh, I think, nine-day period displayed here. And you know, what does this have to do with traffic management? What does it matter that, you know, that this particular event was viewed by all these people? Um, and this is where I get to the users and correctness of response and then back to availability. So what would that news look like if we had poor availability in one of our data centers? And our traffic management system didn't know what to do with it. Maybe our load feedback signal wasn't accurately reflecting the capacity in the system. And so say we've got our East Coast data center, which everybody has, but it's not actually working uh, effectively in rendering this news story properly. It's possible that the users that our traffic management system routed there would get a distorted view of what actually happened, like West Texas. So they would be, if we don't render 
the correct experience for users because we're not taking traffic management, load, um, quality of response type signals into account for when we run our services, we end up distorting what users can actually think is true. And that can actually, can actually blow back on you. you Maybe you, know, you understand that services go down, but a lot of people don't. They don't understand how we work. If they come to our site and don't see a particular news story that they saw somewhere else, they might assume that we're part of the problem. You know, we're hiding the story. Or uh, there's just various things that can go wrong. It can be bad for your brand to not have a reliable signal. So you have to take, when you're thinking about traffic management, think about your users, and that at the end of the day, that we run these services for our users, and that the experience needs to be reliable for them. Moving into what our team does. Um, the talk at Netflix yesterday, they mentioned that they spend a lot of time consulting, and that's very similar to what we do. Um, our team historically has uh, consulted with a lot of the product teams inside of Microsoft to try to advise them on what their current traffic management patterns are. And this is part of a matrix that we use for that that's, um, that's, uh, that allows us to kind of gauge where they're at. And, the, the, the basics of this aren't as important as kind of where the red line is at. And that's really where we look at services that have kind of basic um, traffic management systems uh, versus people who are taking into account that the internet is not a monolithic thing. Below it, it's more like my service and the internet. We've got load feedback, a couple origins, things like that. And above it, you're talking about geo, geogra uh, sorry, geopolitical constraints like tax laws, privacy, um, diverse origins like multiple cloud providers and things like that. Recognizing that the, there's nuances to the internet. It's not just one thing. And it's some concrete examples. You know, when you, you have a startup or something like that, you, you turn it on and, and all of a sudden you might be happy that you've got it in users from all over the world and you're just crazy about it. But then you actually start trying to make maybe processing credit cards or storing privacy data and you realize that you actually have to legally operate in those countries. You can't just do whatever you want. Um, Further down, maybe it's, uh, it's not so much a problem of legal, but you've, you're kind of an advanced company. You've actually taken on, um, you use AWS, Azure, and GCP to, and maybe some on-premises to do some diverse um, uh, provisioning. And because you want to be able to control costs, use the best provider in a region, who's got the best connectivity and such. And you need to have a traffic routing system that can kind of take that into account and get you the best bang for the buck and protect your services. Let's take the legal case uh, as the first, the geopolitical case as the kind of a first example. When you know, you're operating in the United States, you've got your classic East and West Coast data centers, but you want to move into handling German users' data, German privacy data. And so you've got to, based on the current situation, you, know, you need to go over there and you need to get some data centers in Germany. Um, whether you get them yourself or you use Amazon or us or anybody else, it, it doesn't really matter, but you have to be there. And in classic traffic routing, you know, you kind of say, I want to take this set of IPs and route them to the closest origin that's up. And it's pretty simple. Location of rev IP, location of origin, they match, you go to the closest one that's up, no problem. But when you get into something like this, you want to say, well, you know, I really want my German-based users to go to my German data center so I can comply with those laws and make sure their data stays in country. And so whereas Beforehand, you had that basic, your, your DNS system, your GTM system, just had its basic rev IP lookup. Um, in here, now you need to get, uh, add kind of a layer of logic that says, um, well, if that rev IP was from Germany, I can use one type of config. Otherwise, if it's um, rest of the world, use the global config. And that might manifest as, you know, say a user from France, right next to Germany, they can use the German data center. It's okay to store other people's data in Germany, but not okay to store German data outside of Germany. So you look at this and you go, well, I can use any one of those um, origins around the world, and that's fine. But then uh, you get to the German config, and you see that maybe you want to just keep those users in Germany, and you don't actually want to route them outside. And I have the else fail down there at the bottom, and that can get kind of complex. Sometimes it's better to fail, uh, depending on what kind of law you're trying to comply with. But also, it's uh, maybe you choose to else route them back to the US and give them a degraded experience that says you can't do anything while you're in the US experience, something like that. But the point is, is you want to get users to the right place first and then do something special with them. Um, 
So you can use GTM to try to route users in, into the, the right data centers first. Uh, this can be useful for tax purposes or some jurisdictions that if you serve users from outside their country, they uh, want to charge you an extra tax. So you only want to route German users inside Germany. This is a made up example. Germany users inside Germany because it's tax free, but if you were to route France to Germany, it would cost you money. So you don't want to do that. Um, so this is the kind of a geopolitical idea, and that geopolitical really can't get into the political realm when you start talking about uh, some of the countries that want certain things blocked. Uh, won't go into that here, a whole nother conversation. Um, so if that was geopolitical, above that we get into the diverse providers. You can have, like I said before, you can have somebody who's got something like AWS and Azure in their mix, and maybe some on-premises, and some of the classic GTM systems which use like a backbone agent, all those little guys sitting out there, use like a backbone agent to test the availability, uh, or the, let's say the reachability of your particular nodes. And you know they're just running keep alive tests, ping tests, all kinds of availability and health checks, and it's just this giant mesh of, of, of tests all over the place. And that's, that's fine, and it works pretty well uh, when you've got your, your primary networks, like say just the Microsoft network. But as you get a little more advanced, you might be thinking, well, I've got both of these providers in a region, and what happens if one backbone agent running on, on level three or something uh, can't reach one of our Azure data centers, but everybody else thinks it's fine? Now, do you want to take out one of you, say, 25% of your capacity just because one node can't particularly access it? Uh, it's a trade-off. You know, it's entirely possible a set of users can't access that Azure node and your current GTM traffic system is routing them there. Um, that's bad. Taking a node off and uh, causing latency by shifting everybody and higher traffic in the rest of your data centers might actually accrue more damage to more users if you shut that data center down. So you're in kind of a catch here in that you, you kind, of, kind of make a decision on what to do. Does it have to be more than two nodes that don't, um, don't think you're up? Well, one of the solutions one of the companies uh, came up with was to put happy eyeball tests in uh, user agents, basically browsers, uh, you know, Ajax-based requests, instead of running from just backbone agents, they uh, embed the requests, the health checks into web pages that are served from their partners, and they test everything and make sure it's available from more than one location or from, from nuanced locations is more important. Whereas the backbone agents are saying the internet, that, that nebulous idea, the larger internet has connectivity to your data centers. Um, something like this, would say those little guys up in the corner up at that same data center are running health checks themselves. And maybe at some point, you decide that one ISP in that region, for some reason, doesn't have connectivity to the Microsoft network and thus that Azure node. And now that's kind of some corroborated evidence that says, yeah, you definitely got a problem here. But again, you don't necessarily want to take down that whole origin for um, one ISP that might have an insignificant amount of users, but they're still your users and we've got to care about our users. So what you can do in this case is um, just route those particular users to a different data center and protect them from the problem because you know that that ISP is reporting a particular problem. Route them somewhere else and keep everybody going to that data center, keep your capacity online, keep your performance good and really minimize the impact while you get some kind of a notification that you have this problem, and you can handle it as a non-incident issue um, while the rest of your users keep going on. So we did this for since the birth of Bing and before that. So for about five years, we did these kind of strategies. Um, but then, as I kind of pointed out, I did global traffic management routing for about five years before. Now I currently focus on availability and uh, server latency. And that's kind of because I put myself out of a job. Um, what we do now is actually use any cast based routing. So if we talk about evolution, uh, we actually evolved off of DNS GTM and we actually use AnyCast now. And I won't go into the semantics of how we use AnyCast. Nick Holt, as I listed there, is the architect of that particular system and he gave a great talk recently on it. But we, we didn't really like the complexity of the DNS-based routing where you have to have that rev IP database that knows where everybody's at, routes them properly, especially as you move into IPv6. That, that routing table is huge. Um, and it has to be continuously maintained. IP space moves all the time. 
we didn't like it, so we tested out AnyCast, and it took us about a year. Um, and basically, we proved that AnyCast routing for short-lived HTTP connections, particularly like Search, Bing, and similar services, is just as reliable, if not more reliable in some cases. And so we shifted, we got rid of that entire space of DNS rev IP based problems, uh, shifted it back to basically just a DNS server with a zone file. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. We have fundamentally one A record uh, that we hand out globally. And uh, we moved all those problems about getting the right users to the right locations into our peering policies. Um, is that necessarily a whole lot easier? Maybe not, but we had the peering problems anyway. Whether we were using GTM traffic, uh, DNS to route users in the first place, we still had to have a, a really effective network to do things like Windows Update and stream Xbox Live and all those kind of things. We still needed a really reliable network that was peered properly throughout the world for costs and speed and everything. So what we did, we just eliminated the DNS portion of it, moved everything into the peering problem, and pretty much simplified in a way, our global traffic management. And that is talk. If anybody has any questions or uh, do a microphone, if not, you can get with me afterwards, um, talk about traffic routing for hours. Anything? Yes? Do you have any experience that you could share about traffic routing from China? <laughs> Geopolitical problems. So I'll, I'll give the, uh, the rough description of what we do is we isolate our primary domains because we, if you've dealt with, it, with that problem, you know that sometimes DNS and things like the IP spaces get blocked. So we run our China-based users on a separate domain and a separate IP space so that we don't get bleed over when um, there's issues. I don't want to get more, much more specific than that because the technical side isn't any different, it's just the issues. Can you uh, post your email address again? I'm sorry? Can you post your email address again? Oh, absolutely, and, and we'll give the talk. Awesome. It'll be in the, in the talk that posted. Anything else? All right, thanks a lot. Have a nice day.